All right, and we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. Everyone's stuck at home, so we so appreciate you continuing to join us as we highlight amazing scientists and explorers from across the globe. Before we dive in with our speaker today, I want to turn it over to Michelle from Canadian Geographic. She is going to highlight some of their amazing education online programs that they're doing right now. Um, and so, without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Michelle. And uh, Tell us all about what you guys are up to. Thanks, Jesse. And thanks to our new and returning audience members. I see some familiar faces, so that's very exciting. If you saw the session last Wednesday, you know about Canadian Geographic's Anthropocene Education Program that was created in partnership with our guest of honor on today's session. Um, but for those of you hearing about this for the first time, you'll see a link in your email or on the YouTube page that lets you access our website that features augmented reality, virtual reality, photography, film, all connected to today's topic of climate change in the Anthropocene. And you'll get a second link to Canadian Geographic's online classroom, which if you're looking for fun activities to try while schools are still closed, um, it's the place to go. So back to you, Jesse. Fantastic. Well, you did a pretty great introduction of our speaker already, um, but we are joined today by Nick, who is part of the Anthropocene Project. So this is a huge multimedia effort uh, featuring museum gallery exhibitions, a beautiful book, an amazing website, and so much more highlighting human impact on the planet. So two days ago, we covered extinction as our main topic, and today we are diving in with climate change. These are deep, heavy conversations that we've been having for many, many years as a society. Um, but I think that this storytelling effort is a beautiful way of highlighting both uh, what we've done to this planet and the potential solutions. So without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us today, Nick, and take us away. Oh, your audio isn't working, Nick. Sorry, man. <laughs> it was working. Not yet, I'll let you know. The moment we're good. I find smacking the computer helps nine times out of 10. No, it's still not. Sorry, man. No. I don't know. Well, Sarah and Sharon, who were here with us, can attest that it was working <laughs> minutes ago. Um, Nick, one thing you can do, worst case scenario, you can sign out and sign back in again. And then there is another troubleshooting option. Oh, try now. Let's see. Uh, so can you hear me now? Perfect, yes. You can. <laughs> Go for it. Okay. Well, I've gone off my headphones, which are usually reliable, but that's the thumbs up for being able to hear me? Thumbs up. Excellent. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, my name's Nick, and I'm a documentary filmmaker, uh, which means that I get to go around with my video camera and my friends um, and take pictures and tell stories with pictures about things that really interest me um, and that I'm sometimes concerned about or sometimes just want to learn more about. And so I love my job. It's a fantastic job. Um, and one of the places or the sort of topics that it's led me to is the idea of the Anthropocene, which is a really fascinating topic and kind of a big word. Um, but I'll just try and explain it quickly for those who, who don't know. Um, as, as just about everybody knows, uh, scientists who study the history of the Earth and the geological history of the Earth divide up that history into eras and epochs and periods. So lots of people might have heard of the Jurassic, which was the time when dinosaurs lived a long time ago. Um, and that is one of the examples of the names that these scientists give that unit of time when the dinosaurs lived, actually millions and millions of years. So a proposed name for the very time that we're living in right now is the Anthropocene, which means the human epoch. And the scientists are proposing this because they think uh, that it's humans more than any other factor that define the time that we live in. We are such a presence on the earth now in a way that we've never been in all of the earth's history 
that they think you could legitimately call this epoch the human epoch. Uh, as a filmmaker, I thought that was a really interesting idea to look at the effects that humans have on the planet, the way the scientists were looking at it. And the scientists are looking at it using graphs and studies and figures and, and data that's often numbers and stuff that's that if you're not a scientist can be kind of hard to understand. But as a filmmaker, not a scientist, I, I thought, wow, if I understand just enough of that to know what those scientists are researching, maybe I can use what I do with my camera to try and tell the story of that visually. And that idea became the Anthropocene Project. So for uh, almost four years, my friends and I uh, worked on this project that took us all around the world because human impact happens all around the world. And we tried to document it and take pictures of it. Um, one of the categories of research that the Anthropocene Working Group of scientists were looking at was climate change. And climate change, I think, is a defining issue of our time. And in a way, it's quite complicated in terms of how it happens. Um, but in a way, it's quite simple, just the basic concept that the, the way that we live on the planet now as humans is actually changing the overall climate. Um, and that, that has never happened before in history. The climate has changed before in the history of the, of the Earth. We know there have been ice ages where a lot of the Earth was covered in huge glaciers. We know there's been very temperate times. And so the climate has changed, but it's never been humans who have actually changed the climate. And uh, I think part of the issue is that we don't sort of know how these changes might continue and might change things negatively. One of the challenges for us as filmmakers and me as the photographer was, how do you show climate change visually? And I'm gonna start rolling some of the, the images, the, the video footage that um, uh, we took uh, on the Anthropocene project and hopefully that'll kind of demonstrate um, some of these ideas that I'm, I'm hoping to talk about. Can I get a thumbs up that you guys can see a kind of a bulldozer on, on white sand? Okay, so this is an image from the Anthropocene project, which like I said, sort of uh, tried to document a whole lot of different ways that humans affect the planet. So we terraform the planet. That means we move the earth on the top of the planet for mining like this, for agriculture, for building our cities, for building parking lots um, in, in, in lots of different ways. That's one of the ways that we, that we affect the planet. Um, the challenge for the topic of, of climate change is that a lot of the evidence of climate change is actually invisible because we talk about atmospheric carbon dioxide that, that goes into the atmosphere when we, when we burn fossil fuels like coal or uh, natural gas or, or, or gasoline, but you can't see it. So one of the things that we thought we would try and do to demonstrate climate change um, was to show some of those things that I'm talking about, and I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit here. Um, uh, some of those things that I'm talking about, like uh, um, uh, here, for example, is oil refineries outside of Houston. Massive, massive complex um, to refine the, uh, the oil that we get from the ground to do the things that we need to live our lives the way we live them now, to, to run our cars uh, that, that burn gasoline, to power our cities often, um, uh, for electricity to, uh, to power manufacturing. So we can show these images that are part of the story of climate change. And you can see the emissions um, that come from, from burning. But what are the effects of climate change? Some of you may have seen in the news in the last year, since we finished the Anthropocene project, images of uh, wildfires and forest fires in California and in Australia. 
maybe if we if those had been happening while we were making the Anthropocene, we might have included those in um, in our project. But they sort of came after. Um, so one of the things that we decided would be an example of of uh, this sort of evidence of climate change um, is uh, ocean level rise. Because as the climate changes, it's been tending to get warmer. And what that means is that all of the water that is in glaciers and ice at the poles is actually melting at a much faster rate than it has been previously. And that means that the overall ocean, like a big bathtub, is just rising and rising. So here, these pictures you're seeing are an example of a seawall that they're building on the coast of the ocean that is human made. Because the oceans are rising, they're trying to build up the seawall so it doesn't tip over into the land behind the seawall. And they're building this entirely um, unnatural uh, kind of barrier to, to try and hold back the ocean in a way. We thought that was a really interesting example of climate change um, and of, of something that humans are doing to try and adapt, right? This isn't trying to stop the effects of climate change, it's trying to adapt to the effects of climate change. If the ocean is rising, they're trying to make their shoreline in this part of China, and it went for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, uh, they're trying to make their shoreline higher. But that has all kinds of effects, and a lot of them aren't, aren't always positive. If you think of um, uh, the natural uh, biodiversity that happens on a natural shoreline that might have you know, reeds and plants and uh, rocks that form a natural habitat for animals. Well, this is totally different for the animals that live on the shore and the animals that live in the water. Um, so this is a, this is a big change uh, in terms of this whole environment and all of the ecosystems that is a result of climate change. And I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit because another example that we wanted to show um, of uh, climate change is um, uh, coral bleaching. And if you guys have ever seen a coral reef, these are pictures of the kind of incredible biodiversity that lives on coral reefs. And you know, coral has been um, with us for 450 million years. So it's definitely part of our existing ecosystems and natural habitat. And it's, it's actually home to um, uh, 25 percent, almost a quarter of all of the life that lives in the ocean. These are incredibly rich uh, environments for um, uh, different species to live in. And you can see the fish and the turtles and everything um, that live here. This is, in fact, uh, the Great Barrier Reef off Australia, which they call the biggest or the only animal that you can see from space. I thought that was really interesting when I was there, that the scientists I was working with, uh, because coral itself is alive. And what's happening because of climate change is the oceans are getting warmer and they're getting more acidic. So we wanted to try and represent that in the film. And this footage is actually coral that is being bleached. It's going from its natural color and full of life to uh, a, a more uh, sort of lifeless, dormant, it's not necessarily being killed, but it's really being stressed um, by that ocean acidity and that ocean temperature and it's bleaching, which means turning white. Um, and the, the laboratory we were working with, with, uh, with, the photography laboratory, said, you know, how do you want to show this bleaching? Because we could literally pour some bleach like you put in your laundry machine into the tank and, and we'd be done in a day. And then we decided it would be more interesting to show uh, the bleaching. Now we're in the live uh, Great Barrier Reef um, to show the effects of coral that has been bleached. Uh, so this isn't in the laboratory anymore. Um, but we actually replicated the exact effects that the ocean have 
has um, on coral when it's being bleached. And I'm sorry to say that, that um, this year, because there's seasons in the warmer seasons in Australia, you can see how all of this white coral would normally have been a totally technicolor mix of, of yellows and oranges and, and, and different colors. I'm gonna give you another example here, if I can just scroll through of an example of ocean level rise. So this is footage from a city called Venice in Italy. And you guys probably know, but Venice is unique uh, because so many of its streets are actually water. So that to get from place to place, you go by boat. And, and Venice has been living with water, like water in the city for centuries. And that's why we thought it would be an interesting topic because sometimes there's flooding and ocean level rise that, that happens um, you know, quickly and sometimes catastrophically. But Venice has these high waters now that, that are, you know, have been happening for a while, but are much, much worse. Uh, because of climate change. And you can see the city, even when it's not supposed to be water, like these sidewalks are supposed to be for people and these streets are supposed to be for people. But in these high water uh, moments, you can see how ocean level rise is, is even coming up above where the water is supposed to be in Venice. And the citizens of Venice are having to adapt. There's a restaurant that uh, uh, has water in it. And I mean, this is a really interesting sort of visualization of the possibilities of a future with, with climate change and ocean level rise being one of the examples. You can see they build passageways to get through the main square where you're supposed to be able to walk um, without getting wet. Uh, but in these high level, these high water levels, aqua alta, they call them, it's happening more and more that you, you know, you actually can't get around the places you're supposed to. Um, and there's a lot of cities in the world that are uh, very close to uh, sea level. And if the oceans rise, and scientists have trouble predicting how much they might rise, um, that more and more cities and places in the world might have to be dealing with this kind of issue. So, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a complicated issue for sure when you talk about climate change. Um, and there's lots of things that uh, we know that could uh, slow down climate change. Um, and lots of, of governments around the world and lots of groups around the world are trying to enact a lot of those things and put them in place. Um, uh, but there's a lot of scientists who say it may not be happening fast enough to really roll back some of the negative effects of climate change, things like uh, ocean level rise. Um, so this is, this is kind of a snapshot of how we captured the idea of climate change in the Anthropocene project and, and in the Anthropocene film, trying to just look at these specific examples um, of some of the things that climate change, you know, affects that are visual. Um, so I'm not a climate change expert, um, but we can certainly talk about the, the sort of bigger topics um, and, uh, uh, you know, how we tried to approach this topic as filmmakers and photographers in the Anthropocene project. Um, uh, and I'd be happy to, answer any questions or enter into a conversation with any of the students or anyone listening in. Yeah. Marvelous. Well, thank you so, so much, Nick, for such a, a beautiful and sort of haunting imagery there. Um, I do want to note for people tuning in on YouTube, if you're an independent person joining today, just let me know where you're watching from and share your questions and I'll pass along as many as we can. For Queen Street Public School students, uh, you know that Ms. Huxley is live with us, so we're going to pass along questions to her and I'll take as many from her as possible. But I'd like to kick us off with uh, a query of my own, which is when you're doing this filmmaking, obviously you're, you, you know some of the stories you're seeking out. You're going to these places because you know they're going to represent the things you want to highlight in your film. Uh, was there anything on your journey that really, really surprised you when you got there in terms of the impact of climate change? Yeah, and we did a lot of research when you're going to travel somewhere far away from your home. It's very expensive. Um, and uh, we're also conscious that um, our travel uh, has a 
climate change footprint, right? When we get in an airplane, we're responsible for burning a lot of fuel. We want to make sure that, um, you know, we're going to a place that is going to um, be fruitful in terms of the images that, that, we're, that we're bringing back. I think my biggest surprise visiting anywhere that we went was the scale, like something like the China seawall to, to be there and just feel what a massive project it is and how humans are capable of this incredible level of engineering. They can take a whole thing like a shoreline of the ocean and completely change it by, by building it. Um, it, you know, building it in a kind of human image. Um, I think when I'm there with my camera, I'm always trying to uh, take the picture or, or, you know, bring back the image that represents what I felt when I was there. And when I was there, it was like, wow, this place is huge, right? And the scale of this, I just feel so small as one person. There's all these big machines and all this concrete. Um, and they're literally, you know, remodeling the natural world. Uh, I, I think that was the thing that you can, no matter how much research on Google Earth or um, uh, all the things you can do from home, which are amazing now to see these things, satellite images and, and other people's pictures, nothing can prepare you for being there and feeling that in, in person. And that's what I would try and bring back for the film and the video project. Well, I'd say you succeeded because I've, I've seen videos of Venice before and they've been all over the news last year and, and Sharon's nodding her head too. I mean, that is quite the, it, it makes you want to watch the entire film, obviously, to, to get a better sense of this incredible um, piece of work that people were doing to, to you know, mitigate and to adapt to this, this changing world. Um, so with that, uh, Ms. Huxley, if we want to take a question from your class, I'll unmute you and uh, take us away. Okay, so this one is from Michael. I've refined it just a tad bit. How long have scientists been tracking climate change? Yeah, that is a great uh, question, Michael, because uh, scientists have been tracking the climate uh, for, a, for as long as they've been able to, as long as we've had instruments to measure temperature, to measure rainfall. Um, and they haven't been doing that uh, necessarily to track climate change because they started tracking it before the idea of climate change really was was an idea but if you think of the of the utility of of gathering all that information if you are uh, a sailor who works on on a boat and you're going to you know go on a on a voyage you need to know sort of the weather and what the climate is and if you're if you are a farmer you want to sort of remember how much rainfall there was last year in the spring at a certain date to see if you're going to plant your seeds earlier or, or later. So we have data on the climate um, that, that scientists have been gathering and people have been gathering that goes back um, almost since the instruments to measure it uh, were invented. And really interestingly, I think, the scientists now can go back even further than that and measure the climate in ways that I, I think are incredible. One of the most amazing ways is using uh, ice as an archival record. So there are scientists who I've met and interviewed who have spent months of their life on the Greenland glacier in camps and they drill down into the glacier and bring up a core of ice. So it's, it's like a round cylinder of ice that goes down into the glacier. And what they find are there are these lines in that core that are almost like, you know how rings on a tree show how old the tree is? And if you cut across a piece of wood, you can count the rings and each ring represents one year of growth. Well, in the ice, those lines represent one year of winter, summer, winter, summer. And what they can actually do, the ice is very stable for trapping the gases that existed 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago. And the Greenland ice core, they've been able to go back with a continuous record 200,000 years. And they've actually found in Greenland, which is under a, a kilometer of ice right now, they have found DNA from willow, 
trees and from moths from a time when Greenland was ice free. So from a time uh, uh, before the last ice age, which ended 12,000 years ago, where, where the planet was much warmer and, and uh, you know, those things that don't live in the middle of Greenland now were there. Um, so we have a lot of data about our climate and even data that goes, goes back very far. But the idea of climate change is really just in kind of my lifetime. I'm, I'm, I'm 50 and the first sort of, you know, warnings I think started to happen in the, in the 1970s uh, when people started to realize that carbon dioxide levels were going up and up and up and they started to model what these greenhouse gases might do. And the reason they call it a greenhouse, you know, again, going back to the farming analogy, the, the greenhouse is a place that's usually glass that um, gets much hotter than the outside so you can grow your plants, let's say in the spring when it's cold. Last night in Toronto, there was frost here. If you had tender plants outside, they would have frozen and maybe died. But if you have them in a greenhouse, the greenhouse traps the heat and, and protects the plants. So that idea that, that our atmosphere actually was like a greenhouse is where that, that idea comes from of, of greenhouse gases and, and climate change, because the trapping of these gases that we're emitting actually make our atmosphere artificially warmer and trap uh, those, uh, that, that sort of insulating effect of, of those gases. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for that uh, thoughtful answer. Um, Nick, uh, this question we got from a, a group that had to leave uh, midway through the presentation. So this is Sarah from Toronto, her uh, kids. The reason that brought them here today is their curiosity regarding how the current pandemic will shift people's relationships to the planet. And if that has any bearing on the Anthropocene epoch, which is a really deep question. Um, but if you have any insight on that, on, on sort of the current state of things and how that might shift uh, what we're doing, I'd love to hear it. I think um, you know we are living in a in a in a time that um, is going to accelerate a lot of things that were happening before the pandemic, and I think um, for anyone who cares about uh, uh, environmental issues and for the planet, it's not time for us to stop thinking about these things just because we have this other thing that we need to think about. Um, which is the pandemic, obviously. Um, I think if anything, it, it shows the interconnectedness uh, that we, you know, that we all have as, as people on this planet, that we're, the, we're all in the pandemic together. It doesn't matter where you live, um, anywhere in the world, uh, we are all being affected by it and we need to come together to try and solve this problem. I think that's the same kind of collaboration, cooperation uh, that we can muster to try and address some of our challenges around uh, climate and environment. So my hope is that um, as we kind of step back from uh, our, our busy daily lives, rushing to get out the door, to go to school, to go to work, um, you know, a lot of us have more time to think about things big picture. And that was one of the ambitions of the Anthropocene project. These scientists who, who are looking into the Anthropocene and, and, and investigating it, you know, they think in geological time, they think in the history of the whole earth, not just this, this immediate, you know, this week, uh, this month kind of thing, which we tend to do with all of our communications, all of our social media, all of our phones and our access to news, something happens around the world, we know about it in seconds. Um, that's a, that has incredible value. Um, but there's also value in stepping back and being more contemplative and looking more big picture. And that's what these scientists do. They look at the whole planet at the same time, um, not just one little bit or one little issue. They try and be really comprehensive. And they think about the context of deep, deep time, ge geological time. Um, maybe the pandemic in a way is offering us that same moment of contemplation, right? Of stepping back from, from our busy, busy lives and looking at the big picture. And maybe we'll realize things that we could change to make our lives better, to make um, uh, our practices better, 
in terms of, of how we're affecting the planet. Yeah, that was a, a beautiful take on both the positives of the pandemic and of, of climate change and our, our impact and, and relationship to the world. One of the things we've been highlighting in a lot of our programs is the fact that community and the value of people that might, you know, jobs that might not have been valued so much before are starting to be recognized in a huge way around the world. And that's one of the most heartening things of this whole time. So I'm glad we brought that up. Um, Ms. Huxley, I'm going to come back to you for one more question, then I'll wrap up with one when we're done, but I'll come to you first and uh, take it away. Uh, I think uh, one question from uh, Jenna is about uh, chloral, coral bleaching and if there's an idea about how long that has been happening. I know that there's been um, concern about the, re the reduction of the coral reef. Um, is coral bleaching the same or different? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on the science of coral bleaching, but I can tell you um, anecdotally, I, I got to go there. It was one of the most incredible moments of my life to uh, be able to visit uh, the Great Barrier Reef um, to sort of direct the scenes of filming the bleaching. And I went with two older uh, Australian uh, uh, underwater cinematographers. And these, these two guys were incredible. They're kind of my heroes. They've been all over the world all of their lives. Uh, they've filmed Shark Week for Discovery. They've filmed probably a lot of things that you've seen on nature television, on BBC. Um, but they started their love of underwater filmmaking and underwater cinematography uh, started because they're from that part of Australia and they just loved that incredible biodiversity and the colors of all of the fish and the, the, the teeming life that was there. It's so captivating. Um, and uh, that sort of sparked their whole careers and a lot of time dedicated to conservation. They hadn't been back in quite a long time because they, they travel all over the world and go wherever, let's say, you know, Discovery Shark Week sends them. Um, but to see their faces and their reaction uh, to come back from those first dives uh, and to see the change um, uh, in, in, the, in the bleaching. I mean, I hadn't seen it before uh, the bleaching event that we went to film uh, like they had. There was no question to me that this was, um, this was a new thing and this was a, uh, a very powerful uh, uh, negative force. Um, and the, the reef bounced back a bit after that one. Like I say, bleaching isn't necessarily the coral dying. It's a kind of a, a reaction for it from extreme stress and it can come back the next year, but usually not as strong and, and not as much. Some parts of it will die. Uh, and there's no question, uh, they just sort of announced yesterday in the news officially this year is the third major bleaching event uh, in the last five years uh, for the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and uh, there's, uh, there's a great movie called Chasing Coral, if anyone's, if anyone's interested, um, that really delves into uh, this topic. In fact, it came out while we were halfway through filming the Anthropocene, we were gonna maybe do a whole lot more about uh, coral. And because that film covered it so well, we actually sort of changed our direction a bit and, uh, and emphasized some other things. All right. So when you highlight these, these stories of, of major coral bleaching events and, and cities being flooded, it's very easy to get depressed and to feel that there's, there's no hope. Um, and, and we see this a lot with students and we see this a lot with you know, people in our communities. And so I wanna wrap up with a question uh, from the interviews you did with people, from the stories that you helped feature, what is the overabiding sense? I mean, obviously people are concerned and you know, the trend is getting worse, but is there hope for us to do really lasting change to reverse or to stop uh, this, this climate change in its tracks? Um, you know, the, there's a real range um, and, and I, I, I kind of personally have to separate two things. One is your, your, your own human emotions can be very subjective, right? Um, and, and things like hope and fear um, aren't always based on evidence. Uh, sometimes they'll just happen in, in, in reaction, you know, to, 
to something that you might experience or something you might learn, even something like an idea like, like climate change. Um, uh, and I find myself doing that too. Um, although when I was in these places, I, I think it's, it's human to always have, have hope that things can be better. And um, it's interesting, one of, the, one of the great thinkers on, on environmental issues that um, we met over the course of the Anthropocene, she's an emergency room physician who's kind of been studying the psychological effects of climate change and environmental issues. And she says, medically, the, the best medicine for climate anxiety or feeling anxious or depressed about environmental issues, the best medicine isn't to take a pill or something that you might get at the drugstore, it's actually action. That action makes you feel better um, and, and uh, but makes you better able to, to deal with, with these issues. And for me as a filmmaker, that's, that's, uh, I, I believe that because I know I feel better going out with my camera and um, uh, you know, gathering these images and taking pictures because that's a kind of action for me that feels like it might be helping. Um, and I think that's an important message. And the other important message is, is really to listen, to listen to the science. And the scientists say, um, you know, and there's, there's some different opinions and, and, and uh, you know, different sort of levels of, of, of alarm, but they say we have to act, but that if we act, we, we can solve these problems, right? Um, so uh, to, if, to base your reaction to things on, on evidence and on experts like that, I, I think is important too, so that your emotions don't just kind of run away with you. Um, uh, and we have to follow the science and the, the scientists have put us on notice that we, you know, we don't have a whole lot of time to change some of the worst things that we do um, in terms of climate change and in terms of the environment. Uh, but that we can turn things around if we do make those changes. So that's where my, that's where my hope comes from, that we all, if we all keep working for positive change, um, that it will happen, that it's, that's not cause for, for despair. Ms. Huxley's written a, a nice follow-up question to that to really wrap us up. And that is, so if I'm a kid at home today and I've heard this message from you, what are things I can do right now, um, you know, today or this week that can really, uh, you know, do something towards helping stop climate change? As an individual, yeah. So things that 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 we can all do um, individually might seem small, but they can actually be really important because if every individual does those things, then that's a massive shift, right? Um, and one of the best kind of ways of framing this, because everyone's life is different, everyone's practices are different, um, but it's it, it's to take a look at. Uh, all of your activities in a day, in your house, in moving around, um, in, in the things that you do, and try and get a sense of, of your environmental footprint, which I, I think that's a really interesting term. It's like, how, how do my actions affect the environment? You know, Do I leave the lights on in the basement even when I'm not there? Um, do I always say I have to, you know, get a drive to school or to the store when actually I could walk or ride my bike? Like I say, it's going to be different for everyone. But if you if you look at what your footprint is and try and set an achievable goal of let's say I want to I want to lower that footprint by like five percent. And there's calculators online, you know, to try and calculate your your environmental footprint. Um, um, let's say you want to try and reduce it by 5% for a year. And so you're going to change just a few things that are going to make that footprint smaller. And if you're successful, you say, all right, you know what? I'm still living a good life. I'm still, uh, you know, I haven't had to uh, live on a farm and grow my own turnips uh, for food uh, kind of thing. I, I'm, I'm doing okay next year or next month or whatever you think your, you know, your, your ambition is, uh, reduce it by another 5% and try and keep Sort of re reducing your your footprint like that in in whatever you know you calculate has an effect on the environment. Um, I think that's one way. And then the other way uh, we talked about a bit uh, before the other time, but um, there are groups who are full of experts and dedicated people who are full time working on these issues. And you think, how can I support those groups? And even if it's educating yourself about an issue and talking to your friends or um, starting a conversation on social media, if you're on social media, 
that's helping, right? To, to, to gain knowledge and awareness and to share that knowledge among your friends and to start those conversations and have those conversations, that's helping too. Um, those are things that, that anyone can do. Uh, and, and even by sort of listening in and, and having a teacher who might have directed you to some of these things, you are participating in positive change, I believe. Fantastic. It's, every time we, we highlight this as a question, it seems to boil down to two things. Talk about it with friends and family and prevent waste. And whatever you know, element of waste that is, that's something that also applies to preventing plastic pollution. That uh, you know applies to not wasting food at home. I mean, these actions, whether it's uh, emissions or literal waste that goes into the trash, if you do that, you can make a huge impact in the world. That's something everyone can do at home starting today. So, Nick, thank you so much for that message. And uh, for our live viewers at home, we really appreciate you tuning in as we continue to highlight these amazing stories. Uh, the Anthropocene Project is something that we are going to be featuring for many months to come here on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. It's an amazing amazing campaign. You can check out their website, their film, and so much more online or in person when the world opens up again at various galleries and, and places around the world. So for now, thank you so much for joining us today, Nick, and we really appreciate you sharing your, your story with us today. Thanks so much, everyone. Nice to be with you. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Bye for now, guys.